tropics. <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> We start this leg in the Canary Islands. We have four crew members joining us here in Lanzarote for this Atlantic crossing, and my plan is to get us off the dock for a quick orientation, anchor for dinner, then head overnight to Las Palmas, 12 hours southwest, but not everything goes according to plan. There's a long, boring line that might be the best. Okay. What's happening, Paul? We're diving to try to free the anchor, which is stuck on a ginormous rock. The chain is all wound around this rock, so. <laughs> I'm getting cold. Okay. Okay. We'll get that In the past, when our anchor got stuck, it required a quick dive to free it. But this time it's more complicated, so I get my wetsuit on. Plus, it's already dark and it's 20 feet deep here. Right now, we have the anchor chain wrapped around several large slabs of horizontal lava that's been wedged in over time due to the swinging of the boat. So now Paul has been uh, bravely trying to uh, combat hypothermia and <laughs> try to get the chain um, threaded between, unthreaded between the, the rocks. We've removed the anchor, so now uh, it's hopefully uh, an attempt to save the chain. The light from the surface is enough for me to see what I'm doing underwater. I keep thinking I can pull the chain out from underneath these rocks, but it stubbornly refuses to budge. There's slack in the chain, but somehow it's hooked under the huge rocks. Yeah, I see him under, just under the boat. Is he, is, is, should I move the beam anywhere? No, I think it's good there, because he's sort of under the hull. In the end, I make over 15 breath hold dives and try everything we can think of to save the chain, but to no avail. I see some air, so I'm coming up to let my There is. I have no idea. What, if it moved or not? There's a slab of rock as big as a SUV. We're not going to get it off. We have to cut it. Okay. Alright, should we bring the anchor up first, get it on board, and then uh, yeah. cut the chain? We get the engine started before we start cutting and yeah. yeah. Cheryl could probably figure out how much. Well, you probably can't do anything else in the water, can you? No, just get more hypothermia. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, Paul ties a rope on the anchor I mean, and we haul it up off the rocking, seabed. Sorry. That way we save the anchor plus most of the chain, just losing the 15 meters of trapped chain. Yep. I don't want to lose what we just got. No. Well, yeah, clean it off for now. Okay. Now we'll get the grinder. <laughs> and cut the chain. <laughs> okay. Oh, they're sexy. Yeah. <laughs> Brand new, never been used. Woohoo! <laughs> Doesn't get much better than this. I get to play with a grinder so, and go sailing on the same day. Yeah. Yes. This is like so a five-star vacation. Okay, so Nick will keep us in place because once the chain is cut, we will be free from the bottom. So we cut ourselves free and lose 15 meters of beautiful new anchor chain jammed underneath the rocks off Lanzarote. Las Palmas is a very popular staging point for yachts setting off across the Atlantic, and in November it's always chock full of boats. We were lucky to find a berth for a couple of days and celebrate with a final dinner ashore. Thanks for following us. Welcome Alrighty. to the Canary Islands. <laughs> when we do set off from the Canary Islands for the 850 mile trip to the Cape Verde, we have a more auspicious start with nice breezes and no lost anchor chain. On this passage we are crossing into the tropics at 23.4 degrees north latitude. We're leaving the Canary Islands heading southwest, nearly 840 miles to reach Mindelo in the Cape Verde group. We normally plan to make 150 to 170 nautical miles per day on passages. So for this 840 mile passage, at 160 miles each day, we'll need five days. There is a formula to calculate how fast a sailing monohull can go. This is because the boat is creating its own wave, and as the boat goes faster, that wavelength gets longer. 
When the wavelength equals the boat's length, then it's much harder to go faster. For a well-built cruising monohull like the Southerly 480, the length of the hull defines its maximum hull speed with a simple formula. Hull speed is 1.34 times the square root of the length of the waterline in feet. In our case, that's a top speed of 8.8 .8 knots. But we plan at the more conservative speed of 6.6, .6, so we aren't pushing too hard. The dark moonless nights make it easier to see phosphorescent plankton churned up by our stern wake and also luminescent jellyfish, some the size of basketballs. After five days at sea, we're approaching the Cape Verde Islands at dawn and the harbour of Mindelo. The Cape Verde Island group is perfectly positioned to start an Atlantic crossing, and a number of sailing rallies choose this as the departure point, including the Atlantic Rally for Cruisers, ARC+. Plus. This year, starting two rallies with close to 100 boats taking part. We just stop taking a look at the masthead, see that everything's okay up here. And it's also a great time to get a view over Mindelo, population 70,000, and a good spot for us to top off provisions for the crossing ahead. It's nice to have a couple of nights rest without the boat bouncing around, then the morning we set off, I do a crew briefing with weather summary to get my crew prepared for two weeks at sea. Okay, so we've got probably 12 days or so, 13 days across the Atlantic. We've got a really good first week. We've got this nice wind today. It would be really breezy if we weren't going nice and downwind, but we got a nice downwind sail, probably a broad reach, maybe get out the twin poles. And uh, everyone stay safe. We're not gonna really race across. We're gonna have a nice, safe cruising passage and comfortable and looking forward to getting across to the Caribbean. I'm excited. This is gonna be great. This is a, a bucket list item for me and uh, hopefully it'll set the stage for our future cruising career. So this is going to be a lot of fun. And Shirley, how about you? What are you looking forward to or thinking about on this passage? Oh, I'm looking forward to watching the stars and the moon and uh, yeah, enjoy, enjoy the passage and learn a bit more about the sailing. Very excited. I've been looking forward to this since I was 20 when I first uh, planned or envisaged doing an Atlantic crossing. Unfortunately, my day job got in the way. Um, until this year and I now am traveling with the uh, probably the best people to show me how it's all done so really looking forward to it. We have a great crew yes, always smiling. Yes. It's great having you on board. You are wonderful. Everyone is wonderful. We do have a great crew. We're looking yeah. forward to an Atlantic cross. That's Kered, our sister ship, 4802, one of the new Southerly 480s. From the Cape Verde Islands, it is a 2100 mile passage across the Atlantic Ocean to the Caribbean Sea and our destination, Antigua. The boat is well stocked with fresh and frozen foods and supplies for the crossing so we don't rely on catching fish for dinner. Oh yeah, look at the tail, oh wow. But fishing is a popular pastime with the crew and after a few big ones get away, we slow down the boat to make it easier to reel them in. Oh, it's you see them clear through the wake there. Oh yeah. All right, that's at least as big as the biggest. Oh, yeah, you keep pulling now, wow. Yes, thank you for your sacrifice. What a magnificent mahi-mahi. This is the Mai Mai we caught this morning. How big is that, do you think? It was I don't know. Four or five pounds, maybe? Maybe. Five pounds. Maybe, yeah. 
yeah, it was I'm a big one. And it was beautiful, so we're eating it like just an hour after it was caught. And uh, wow. steering as we're mooring along. <laughs> So we've been having trouble with the sheets for both of the sails out on the poles. So the end of this part that goes through, do you have that other end there? The end of the part that goes through the, where it goes through the pole was chafing. So this one has chafed right through in about six days of wear, probably five days at the end of the pole, it chafed right through like that. So we're trying to kind of coat the rope to protect it with something. And this will be the part, we'll shackle this onto the sail and then this will protect where it goes through the pole. And then also this edge here was getting a little bit beat up. So Mike came up with this idea that we can put a little disc made out of another piece of hose pipe stuff. And that is gonna protect ah, brilliant. like that. So now, now the pole is in there chafing away on something that's much more protected. And I've stitched it on down here so that the hose can't move out of the way. So. We pushed the hose, which is a tight fit in the rope, and then when it was in the position, I stitched through using a palm and some heavy thread so that this can't slide out of the way. We always have to stay here on the rope. It can't wiggle out. So. We run three watches of two people each for four hours at a time, then eight hours off. For most of this passage we have winds from behind, so the breeze you feel is reduced by the boat speed. But with the rare occurrence of a beam wind, Nick Gill gets out his most advanced offshore sailing jacket to demonstrate how well protected you can be from spray and rain. Nick is using this passage to test out some of the new Gill Marine designs. This is our favorite rig with the two poles for downwind. We've got the Jenny out on the carbon pole and then we've got the self-tacker out on the aluminum pole on the other side. And this we've been using it now for a few days and because the two poles allow you to just have it totally rock solid locked in, that's our favorite rig for ocean crossing, especially this Atlantic route. Sargasso weed lives out in this part of the ocean, also known as the Sargasso Sea. So I'm just going to go up to the bow and take a look at how this system's working. We've been running downwind under two poles, which is a system I've always wanted to have. It's the first boat we've had it on. We have two downwind poles, we can run our two head sails uh, at the same time and in fact the winds have been perfect for that so we've had now I guess it's uh, 13 days of running downwind. I'll just go over the system and show you how it works. So here you can see the whole rig. We've got the two poles. This is a aluminum spinnaker pole. It's quite heavy duty and it runs on a track up the mast. And then the track is controlling the inboard end of the pole and the outboard end of the pole is controlled by the topping lift and by the fore and aft guy. 
So that means that even if you roll the sail away, the sail will be put away and the pole will just stay there. It won't move very much, but you can leave it out. So if we wanted to remove it or stop it, we can just leave the pole up. The other pole is run by similar lines. So the, there's a second track on the mast that holds that pole end in place. And it's also controlled also by a topping lift for guy and after guy. And then the sheet just runs through the end of the pole with chafe protection where it goes through the jaw of the pole to stop it from when you get bangs and everything like that, then at least it's banging, but it's not going to chafe and wear the, the sheet away on the end of the pole. So we've had that out for a few days now, and I think we've got the chafe problems all sorted out. And this has got us averaging 160 to 170 miles a day with fairly light winds blowing in the sort of 15, 17 knot range is almost the whole crossing. It's been great. And uh, certainly at least having one pole means you can really get a lot better downwind performance. We've always wanted to have this system where the two poles, the two sails mean that the helm is so light because the boat is being pulled along like having two big horses pulling on each side and it's not tending to spin the boat around when an extra breeze blows stronger. So if we had just got one pole out here, you'd be pulling the boat from the one side and the strong wind would tend to, to steer it around. As it is, it's so light on the helm, it's easy to steer. And we've been getting good mileage runs and enjoying the passage that way. And the autopilot has had a bit easier time of it too. Unlike a spinnaker, we can easily reduce sail in the squall, reefing the big Genoa first or both of the sails. It was at night we appreciated the two poles the most, as we didn't have to reef, but kept our speed up safely and were ready to reef easily. You can see much of the rig here. Uh, this, is, this is the topping lift, this green line uh, raises this end of this pole, keeps that pole up. The pole is quite heavy. It's uh, certainly more than 10 kilos, I think, perhaps 15 kilos. Then the inboard end is controlled by these jammers on the mast. And the uh, outboard end by the fore guy, the after guy, and the topping lift. At the end of our 13th day at sea, we're approaching Antigua at dawn. We've sailed the whole crossing, and as we come into Falmouth Harbour, our sister ship, Carrot, is right behind us. Welcome to Antigua! <laughs> this was our ninth Atlantic crossing, and if you're dreaming of crossing an ocean, why not check out our videos from previous crossings, or our seminar on how to sail your boat across an ocean. If this is your dream, we want to help you achieve it.